Hi, this is Professor McLaughlin with a lecture on Chapter 22 in our Melvin textbook, Criminal Law and Procedure in Business. So great um, introduction to criminal law in general, and then a real focus on white collar crime. And so um, as you take a closer look at um, the syllabus coming up, we do have an assessment next week. Next week's Thanksgiving, but we haven't, uh, so the due date won't be um, the Monday after Thanksgiving. But um, really what we want to do is focus on um, criminal acts that are specific to businesses, what agencies are involved. But let's start with a overview, a broad overview of criminal law, so you get a sense for the uh, how it's um, the framework of it in the United States. So model codes are frequently created to make it easier for uh, states to have uniformity in terms of laws. So the model penal code was created and states were able, nationwide, states were able to adopt it in part or in whole and use that as the penal code. And you can see where um, some states might not want, uh, there may be some criminal activities that are unique to certain states if states are rural. Uh, more urban, if there's a lot of water. Um, so criminal activity will be uh, emboldened, curtailed by state location, state culture, the size of the state, um, and the history of the state. So not all states are going to want, uh, are going to be able to have similar uh, penal codes. They will be very specific. to that state and to its location. I apologize for the formatting. I'm not going to be able to correct it. Let me finish. These slides are available in your Canvas. Um, so let's do some, uh, uh, lay some foundations for um, the criminal law. So we know from our previous reading in this chapter that civil laws compensate us for harm we're causing one another. Um, breach of contract, medical malpractice, a slip and fall, a fender bender. But criminal statutes, excuse my funky low tech, criminal statutes are about protecting society and things that we, uh, for lack of a better word, as a tribe have decided we don't want to see in society. And so criminal statutes protect society. It is harm against society. Yes, there will be victims and there will be uh, persons and business entities will be victims and also perpetrators. But we're not really talking about harm that we cause one another per se. We're talking about uh, the harm we perceive when uh, tribe members don't comport their behavior uh, the way we need them to, to keep everybody safe. A um, couple other foundational concepts. When we harm each other in a uh, products liability case or a breach of contract, we have a burden of proof that is the preponderance of the evidence. So I want you to think about a scale and the weight of that scale. Um, proving just enough more that a defendant committed a wrong. But for criminal cases where the ultimate payment may be incarceration or in very serious crimes, death penalty, if the state has a death penalty, the burden of proof is heavier. The government must, I will say it's a higher standard that must be proved. The government has to prove beyond a uh, reasonable doubt 
that the defendant committed the criminal wrong. And generally, criminal law theoretically and idealistically in its uh, most purest um, hopeful form, it's, it may act as a deterrent, uh, it, it may remove dangerous criminals from the population, it may rehabilitate but as we're seeing much and more, uh, much uh, uh, after recent events, we're seeing uh, maybe a spotlight uh, shined on the weaknesses in our criminal justice system and how it can be weaponized against certain uh, parts of our community and how that needs to be reformed. And as we look at that reform, we need to look at reform with criminal justice as well, which would include how we approach um, white collar crime and and then how we prosecute um, everything should be looked at so criminal liability has two parts you have the physical part where somebody did something or omitted to do something and then you have the mental part which is focusing on the defendant's state of mind what were they thinking when they did that so to be a crime, you need both those things, a bad act and then a bad mental state. And I use that in a very moral way. So for the bad act, you have to, the government has to show that the defendant's actions satisfy all the elements of the particular offense. So uh, criminal law, I think, uh, is one of the best, one great analogy for criminal law is it's very much like chemistry or, or um, baking. Uh, you need a leavening ingredient. You need certain ingredients so that your bread or whatever you're baking uh, sets just right, has the right consistency. And if those ingredients are missing, you, you won't, won't get bread. <laughs> You'll get something else. Um, so in general, you need that act requirement and the just thinking bad things does not a crime make. There needs to be a physical act. And our guilty mind, our bad mind, as I referred to it, has to have the requisite degree of culpability for each element of a given crime. So, uh, and that's called mens rea. Actus reus is our bad act, mens rea is our bad thought. But you can defend. Um, and if you look at these defenses, many of these defenses have to do with mental state, self-defense. Um, I was in fear of my uh, bodily safety or my life, and so I acted. Uh, mental incapacity, or do you understand the nature of your acts? Are you, is there mental illness? Is there insanity? Is there a low IQ? And then less common defenses, intoxication, which um, may inform how the jury or the prosecutor sees the commission of the crime, but doesn't um, negate a, 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 a bad mental state because presumably you we're not uh, that you drank it yourself. I mean, it would change if you somebody slipped you a Mickey or somebody put something in your um, uh, something you you I I ingested something and you weren't aware of it. Then that is an entirely different mental state. So there's different kinds of crimes, and in this slide really is just describing punishment. So so a misdemeanor, less punishment probably just a fine, maybe even no incarceration, but felonies, we, we're going to label a felony something more serious and the a time of being incarceration would be higher because the society doesn't want to see this. And um, criminal law and business entities, <laughs> apologize for the goofiness, but it's going to continue. 
Um, remember that so corporations have many arms. They have managers and executives and boards of directors. And how criminal liability is assessed for businesses is slightly different. So if you're in an organization, you're with a group of people, um, you're, you're seeing it now with the Blizzard CEO saying he, uh, Activision Blizzard didn't know anything about the sexual assault or the rapes that happened. Um, and uh, somebody else might have known about it. Um, but other people are agents of the business. And if you are not responsible for, uh, or let me put it another way, you must be responsible for the um, activities that you are um, overseeing as a manager, uh, as an executive, and it can be criminal to fail to address problems. And some of the, you've got some really interesting reading in this uh, chapter, like the Park uh, Doctrine. So, um, criminal liability for businesses has grown over the years where individual officers and directors can be held criminally culpable for corporate co crimes. Um, so, uh, if you have a, um, extractive industry company that goes to a less developed country and is um, uh, not careful and uh, uh, local people are hurt. So if you have an oil company that goes to Nigeria and is excavating and hurts workers or doesn't follow safety, um, those crimes can, uh, the liability for those crimes can be borne by individual officers and directors. And we're seeing that more and more where corporations can be charged with rape can be charged with uh, assault, murder, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about white collar crime. So the white collar crime, it's got a historical element. Maybe we need to change it, but bankers wore white collars to work. Uh, they wore dress shirts and those dress shirts had, were white and uh, people who work in offices wear white dress shirts historically. And those crimes, things of uh, fraud, bribery, theft, where people had access, it usually involves finance, but it doesn't have to. Um, as opposed to blue collar workers who were more trades and hands on. So we still bear that name. It may be, uh, we need to get rid of it. It's really not. Uh... Okay, so fraud, which is a really important um, white collar crime, uh, and you can have all kinds of fraud. We're going to talk about Ponzi scheme frauds, but really we're talking about a crime where you're lying to somebody and the deceiving them, misrepresenting something, and you're taking something from them uh, using some instrumentality. It could be by phone, in person, by email. Um, you're maybe hacking into their online banking. Um, that fraud is um, a, a type of white collar crime. Ponzi schemes, which we're going to spend a little bit of time here, is, is uh, described in your chapter. And this is um, really uh, getting an initial investor and using the money that initial investor gives you to attract other investors and then paying back that initial investor with money from subsequent investors. So you're not actually uh, growing wealth or investing in a way that gives a return that's actual. You're promising high returns that aren't real 
and the, the way you're able to satisfy that claim is because you have future investors who um, are, are, are we over? Am I going back and forth yet? I'm not. Here's Charles Ponzi of future investors who are constantly being the sheep led uh, to slaughter and giving uh, money in. So it's a swindle or a ploy where earlier investors are paid with funds given by subsequent investors and there's not actually a wealth uh, increase or value increase or an increase in uh, revenue stream. It's all a scheme to make things look one way, which they are definitely not. So it, the Ponzi promoter gets money gives it back and forth to the investors, always needing additional investors to make it work. And it grows and uh, the scheme starts to collapse when uh, money starts to get um, uh, scarce or you have a, a real moment, which happened to Perny Madoff, which is the housing crisis happened and it revealed that nobody could be making the kinds of uh, returns Madoff was claiming on Wall Street because the market was crashing. Um, and yet those, uh, he continued to maintain that those returns were being made. And frequently, um, what you find out is that the, the promoter, the Ponzi promoter, was really just supporting an extravagant lifestyle and just thought it wouldn't stop. Um, so uh, just a small graphic of the people, the well-connected banks, um, smart, smart people connected to Bernie Madoff, and um, they were completely sure that he was um, getting these returns on Wall Street or willfully blind, difficult to know. But Madoff was definitely a Wall Street insider. He chaired the board of NASDAQ. Um, he uh, was just, everybody knew him and he had been around for years. Um, what you see here is the massiveness of the loss and what can we take away from this gra uh, graphic? Um, I talked a little bit about WorldCom and Enron in the aughts, but Madoff is what, 2009, 2010? Pardon me, and the losses attributed to his fraud is just massive in comparison. Um, just don't know what the takeaway is from that. Are we looking at steps of a ladder? Are we, um, you know, after Enron and WorldCom, we pass Starbane's Oxley. After the subprime credit crisis, we pass um, Dodd Frank in an attempt to stem some of these losses, um, but they continue. I mean, this is just a small grouping of the kinds of organizations that lost money with Bernie Madoff. Um, in the bankruptcy court uh, filings, it, uh, it was a 162-page list naming thousands of victims of his um, fraud and scheme. So the scheme went on for so long. How could all these sophisticated individuals, um, how was he able to claim he re had consistent returns for so many years? Is this just the unraveling of um, the 1% white privilege? I don't know. Uh, certainly there was a uh, small group who kept giving money to Madoff. Um, there were mutual funds and I'm sorry, I'm going to ruin this. You have to just see this and then oh, here's a nice, that's much better. And then you have all the, um, I mean, who's feeding into it for a Ponzi scheme. You need a continual, continuous inflow of money. Um, and maybe he was treading water as fast as he could to keep the money flow. 
Um, it was repeatedly investigated. We're going to spend some more time on this next week. Um, but let me uh, kind of speed this up a little bit. What slide am I on? Oh, uh, hold on. Let's wrap this up so I can... I don't want this to go t on too long. Uh, let's stop here. Um, so the Securities and Exchange Commission... Oh, pardon me. Securities and Exchange Commission... Uh, not FINRA was in charge of Madoff, and they, Madoff was an investment company. But they were understaffed. Lawyers aren't necessarily financial experts. It's very political. Um, little deterrent effect. Uh, hedge funds are fre frequently not in compliance. Is that such a big deal? Oh, and who bears the brunt of um, these losses? It's not Wall Street. It's definitely um, a problem whose roots uh, continue to be rotten, and it's not quite solved. Um, we'll stop here, and I'll, I'll create a second video for the remainder of the slides for Chapter 22.